welcome to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ, the podcast. I believe that the best coach you can ever have is that one person that is staring straight back at you every morning in the mirror, you. Join me in discovering some key strategies so that you can create an empowered life and inspire others to live theirs. Your journey to being your own best coach starts right now. Welcome back, guys, to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. I am interviewing the amazing master coach and creator of the Emotional Fitness Formula, Joe Parnay. Now, Joe Parnay is an expert in human behavior, degree qualified in psychology and sociology. He has been working in the field since 2006, working with a range of private clients through to larger corporate organizations, helping improve their effectiveness and results by coaching them on managing their own emotional and social intelligence. His clients have ranged from multinational corporate groups through to more intimate personal groups. He's range of clients have included Jones Lounge LaSalle, I think I've got that right, Flight Centre, ANZ, Department of Defence, Ray White, the Coaching Institute, Museum of Contemporary Art, Coles Group, NBN and various primary school principal and deputy principal networks. Joe is a creator of the Emotional Fitness Formula, an online training program for organisations and individuals alike. Joe is also the coach's coach In the last 14 years, he has trained in excess of 6,000 behavioural mindset coaches on behalf of the Coaching Institute, Australasia's largest coaching school. Many of these coaches now work in the field today nationally, and I'm one of them, (laughs) and internationally. Joe married his wife, Silvana, in 1996, and their twin boys, Oliver and Nicholas, were born in 2008. And I'd love to welcome Joe Parnay. Thanks, Joe. I'm so excited. Now, the listeners will know your name because I can't tell you how many times I've mentioned you and quoted you. And uh, so they'll probably say, who is this Joe Parne? So it's going to be great for them to to meet you via the podcast. I appreciate you having me. Yeah. So I want to know, and I can't, I, when I put these questions together, it was really exciting because I'm really going to dive deep into the yeah. stuff that I want to know about you. Yeah. Um, so when did your journey of coaching start? Uh, well, uh, in 2005. So... So what happened was I was working in the world of real estate and before that in the world of uh, rehab counselling, which was my first job out of uni, um, and pretty much did that for 10 years, those two jobs combined. And yeah, I, I was, uh, I guess, the metaphorical, you know, lost in the fork in the road kind of situation. And, and, and I was reading something yesterday uh, from the novelist uh, whose name is uh, Wendell Berry, and he said something along the lines of that when you... Um, when you don't know which way to go and you don't know what to do, that's when your real journey begins. You know? yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so I was going through that experience myself back in 04, 05. And literally I took a year off work. I, I was on a sabbatical. I did all these different meditation retreats and different things that I went on, which was just mind-blowing. Um, I had to reverse back into, a, into my job because I was running out of money. And then literally sitting under a tree in a park, I still remember where that was, um, I, I saw an ad for uh, for coaching, which was uh, Sharon Pearson, the founder of the Coaching Institute, and uh, pretty much from there, uh, well, well, that was the first time I, I noticed a spark of excitement uh, around something. So, to have your own personal development business was something that was just crazy, crazy good. Yeah. And um, yeah, so then I, I quit my job. <clears throat> Excuse me. I borrowed uh, thirty thousand dollars from the bank um, and <clears throat> paid for my program and got started and haven't looked back since even though it's had its challenges but hasn't haven't looked back since so, yeah. yeah so when you decided to go into you know you saw the ad and that excited you were you thinking this is what I want to do for a living or were you thinking I need some personal help myself like what was it that that really no for me it was um, this is what I want to do for a living because I yeah. had already been working on, on myself if you want to say it like that um, in the previous three or four or five years I mean the, the, the sabbatical that I, that I had was 15 months. And I mean, that was an acceleration. Well, that was a turbocharge of, of waking up because the residential retreats, the, the silent retreats, the vision quests, the, uh, the meditation stuff that we did, <clears throat> the breath work, 
Uh, there were so, so many different avenues that uh, what we experienced experientially. So these weren't things that we were learning in the classroom. There was stuff that we were experiencing in our bodies. Yeah. Um, and that was, um, that was, to say it was life-changing is a, is a, is a big understatement. Um, it shifted everything. So it shifted my identity. It shifted how I saw the world and myself in it and all the rest of it. Um, and so all of that work had already been done, plus the personal development that my previous employer had exposed us to, which was just incredible. So really, leading into it, I had nearly 10 years of personal and spiritual development work uh, that I'd experienced. So now when I saw the ad, I was like, no, this is what I want to do for a living. Yeah. So, yeah. And I can imagine, like, <clears throat> all of those years ago, it, it wasn't like it is now, like like going to a retreat and doing this, you know, this having days of silence is pretty, you know, people do that now. But yeah. years ago, did people think you were a freak? <laughs> well, I never, I never told anyone. I mean, yeah. no one really knew. Uh, other than my, obviously my wife, because she ended up doing all the same workshops later. Um, and, uh, you know, a couple of my closest friends. Other than that, no one, there was nothing to explain. It was just too hard yeah. to explain. So yeah. people just thought, oh, he's having some time off. And that's yeah. It. So. And even the coaching world has changed in that time, yeah, hasn't it? What, how people see coaching. Everything has changed. I mean, back then... You know, it, it, and we're only talking, you know, 14 years ago. It's not like we're talking 38 years ago, but yeah, um, yeah back then coaching was all brand new. Life coaching had never been heard of, um, whereas now it's the, it's the opposite. You know, it's, it's, it's really well known and readily accepted into lots of different uh, organisations. So, yeah. yeah. What is it about coaching you love so much? Um, what is it about coaching I love so much? I think it's like a vehicle that um, gives me a sense of... Um, sense of meaning it's a feel-good feeling because it's like a classic example was yesterday you know um i did a, a zoom class for a um for comcare which is a, a national lawyer group that's employed by the government um and we did a whole thing on emotional fitness a, a certain part of emotional fitness and i know i know based on feedback that i've had people from that session you know their life their, the trajectory of their lives have shifted because of something that they they learned in that session um only three weeks earlier, I did a session for um, a group called the Planning Institute. And the Planning Institute of Australia, you know, these are very left brain logical kind of people. And this, that's, that's a sweeping generalization. Um, and, and I've received this morning a, just a gorgeous email from one of the, the ladies who attended uh, saying how much has changed her life. So to me, coaching is, um, it's, it gives me a sense of peace because it's like I'm living regret free because I'm pretty satisfied with. Um, the contribution I've made to other people's lives and not that I want to stop that I want to keep going until whenever the, the death comes but um, you know but so that's what it gives me it gives me a sense of peace and um, regret free existence and um, it's also taught me how to live you know? yeah that's yeah. beautiful and I think the beautiful thing too is that ripple effect so sometimes you know the people that you've touched mm. because you get the emails yeah. but then it's such a ripple effect. So, you know, it's the children that, that they're, yeah. they're bringing up, the parents, the, you know, all the other people that you don't even know that you touch. It's such a beautiful ripple Absolutely. effect to help people. Absolutely. I yeah. love that. It's a beautiful way to live, I think. Yeah. How's coaching transformed you as a person? Um, it's transformed uh, me in the sense of um, uh, being a man. So Sylvana and I have been married for 24 years. Uh, when I started this, journey we had only been married 10 and um only 10 but uh <laughs> you know I, I i i reckon i reckon if um you know that that man of 14 years ago like the woman that Silvana was 14 years ago we both no longer exist so if those two people still existed they wouldn't be together today you know? yeah so one of the significant contributions that coaching's made to my life is that it's, it taught me how to emotionally grow up and uh, take responsibility to a whole other level in terms of uh, being not only a man in a, in, a, in a marriage, but also as a man in society. So yeah. yeah. What do you think, what are the keys to a successful coach, do you think? I think um, uh, unconditional commitment to what you want to become and what you want to do. Um, insatiable curiosity in terms of people and life and how things seem to work. Um, forward thinking, open minded, um, someone who spends more time in the future than they do in the past in yeah. their mind, um, and and I think <clears throat> it's also a healing journey for a lot of coaches because a lot of coaches get uh, healed of their 
of their past pains by helping other people. Right? Yeah. So um, I think that's a that's a big part of it as well. So. It's interesting because when, when years ago when I first started as a coach and even before, I always used to pride myself on being open-minded. And then when my when I had my child, my son, who's now 22, uh, he's been one of my biggest teachers. He's, yeah. he's amazing. Uh, but I actually realised how non-open-minded I was because he challenged, you know, our beliefs are so strong. Yeah. When someone challenges your beliefs, it's like, yeah. whoa. Yeah. Um, and I think from... I remember from my coaching journeys, remembering that it's just like a blank canvas when that that person comes in. It's like it's a blank canvas. Your beliefs and all of that's put aside. And um, I love Stephen Covey's quote, which goes something like, you know, seek first to understand, to be understood. And it's really clearing all of those and being able to to see see it from their world and their perspective. A lot of people, unfortunately, are caught up in the you know like the historical data of their lives you know they're caught up in belief systems that might have helped them you know 10 years ago that are no longer relevant now well a lot of people even have got belief systems that helped them when they were seven eight nine ten years of age and at 40 years of age they've still got those beliefs that don't hold you know don't hold any step anymore um yeah so i think i think yeah you know our belief systems and i call them convenient assumptions these convenient assumptions that we've made about all these things in life need to continue to evolve just like our values our values are, are, are another expression of belief system and they need to evolve as um, as time goes on because if we don't catch up or if we don't keep up with who who we are becoming you know we're going to experience a lot of pain so yeah. uh, the journey is all about keeping up with who you're becoming because the change the identity shift the value shift the belief evolution all of that's happening organically so you, you can't stop it and if you don't, uh, if you if you're busy defending your past against it, then um, gee, that's a that's an awful trap to be caught in. Yeah, one of the quotes I often say that you've mentioned in the past is, "If you're green and growing, you're ripe and rotting." And yes. I say that so often. Yeah. Uh, and even through we're talking about beliefs, the COVID situation at the moment, my beliefs have changed in the last freaking couple of months. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. and so I think us to keep opening, you know, ourselves up to learning. Uh, but with being a business owner, how have you navigated through the the COVID nineteen? Uh, well, I've been I've been really blessed, and and I think all of that's been set up probably from the previous you know thirteen fourteen years. But um, no, I've been blessed. It's um, I, 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 what I at the very beginning of the COVID tunnel, the first thing I did was I rang all of the recent clients that I delivered workshops for in the previous six months. And I said to them that, you know, I offered them, you know, a couple of free Zoom trainings or online trainings to support them in the early stages of all of the, you know, the uncertainty hit. You know, uncertainty has always been a part of life, but of course, you know, in the beginning stages of COVID, we were, we were experiencing an, an acute dose of it. Yeah. So, um, so I started doing that with no intention of converting them to paying clients. I, I'd already sort of thought to myself, well, your income, you know, it's going to probably go down a little bit. Uh, I started hearing how you can pause mortgages at the bank, and I thought, at the end of the day, you can stop. Everything is, you'll you'll get the support that you need. You'll be yeah. okay. You'll survive. But what ended up happening was the um, pretty much ninety percent of those freebies that I did, um, those guys wanted to continue. So and they ended up paying for that. So so now I'm running workshops from home for my study, and <laughs> it's just incredibly great. You know, to the point that my wife is all excited because she wants to. Uh, you know, travel around the world. She said, now you can do this from anywhere, see? So, <laughs> um, so I've been blessed through the COVID thing. So in other words, it's brought into my awareness uh, possibilities of the work continuing, um, doing the sessions and the trainings in a way that I never thought was possible because there's no way I would have offered clients a Zoom training session um, yeah. before COVID. So um, that's been truly remarkable. So yeah, I haven't been affected um, much at all really it's been very been very fortunate yeah very what fortunate. what advice would you give to the business owners right now now that are a challenge uh through COVID well it's a difficult question to answer because yeah. it depends on what kind of business yeah. I mean one, one of my clients um you know their their income they're, they're in the health and fitness field so their income ground all the way to zero in, overnight and I ran a series of workshops for them for free. Yeah. Um, and for them, you know, 
we were just talking about the fundamentals of our relationship with uncertainty and ambiguity and how uncertainty has been there the whole time. And, and this is the time for us to, you know, come together. This is the time for us to, um, you know, get really clear on what really matters and what doesn't matter. So, um, you know, I spoke, I, I just spoke to them a lot about how, you know, emotions aren't created by facts. You know, the facts don't create the emotions. Your perception and the meaning that you give those facts um, is what creates the emotion. And the other thing I, I, I would share with business owners that I shared with these guys was um, the power of negative visualization, which is from the Stoic philosophy. So the Stoics, uh, Stoicism is uh, misunderstood as being emotionless when really it's one of the most emotional kind of philosophies you can, you can um, you know, get your mind around. And the Stoics spoke about the, the power of negative visualization, which is in essence seeing things a lot worse mm than what they actually are and then reversing back to where you are and suddenly feeling good about that. So, um, yeah, so I, I would uh, teach them how to do that and, uh, and that, would, that would help a lot. Yeah, yeah. 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 What, what's been your biggest challenge in business? You've been in business for a long time now. How many years have been in business? 14. 14 years. Yeah, the, the, the first couple of years, um, especially the first sort of 18 months, there were a number of occasions where I wanted to quit. Because I went from a full-time job for 10 years into you know, being 100% responsible for generating my own income. and So that was really, really unfamiliar, um, to put it really nicely. So there were, there were some weeks there where I couldn't see where the next dollar was going to come from. So I was tempted to go and find a job. And uh, yeah, so the first thing I would do when I was tempted to do that is I would make another appointment with a potential client or a new client or you know go to a networking event or something just to keep myself engaged on you know in the mission of what I was trying to create so they're, they're the most difficult times the psych, the psychology the psychological times of wanting to reverse back you know <clears throat> when the future is scary to, if the perception of the future is scary all we want to do is reverse back into the past but what, by doing that we soon discover that we don't belong there anymore we can't fit in there anymore yeah and if you're afraid to move forward and you find that you don't belong back there anymore that's when you have a crisis yeah, that's when you have a real issue so um coaching taught me that you know you've got to keep moving forward so because i tried to reverse and i couldn't find my way there so it's like this i don't belong here anymore it's like it's like visiting i don't know your old school or an old hometown that you used to live in and just find that you just don't fit in there anymore. You know, it's yeah. just not, you're not part of that anymore. You're not that woman or that man anymore. So I think, you know, continually, you know, failing forward, moving forward uh, is, is essential. Yeah. So most difficult times have been those times where I wanted to quit. And I've been very blessed with my health. I've been blessed with uh, having phenomenal people around me. And uh, I've learned how to, to develop good connections and great relationships with people. And that's really helped my work a lot. And life. Yeah. yeah. In, in your career, what are you most proud of? Um, what am I most proud of? I've, never, I've been asked that before. <laughs> um, I guess I'm proud of... Um, so I'm proud of this. I'm proud of... I, I say to people, uh, like recently in workshops, I've been saying, you know, a great life is simply a handful of courageous decisions. That's what a great life is. You, you have a great life experience when your choice points, you have a handful of choice points that have taken every ounce of courage in you where you've had to press pause on life to change direction. That to me is gutsy and courageous and I admire that deeply. Yeah. So what I'm most proud of is the handful of moments in my life where I made those conscious decisions that have led me to where I am today. Because most people don't make those decisions. They just fall into life. They live their life by default. So yeah. they, 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 they fall into the family business and they just get stuck there or they have fallen into that marriage and they stay there for too long or they live their life by default. They're not consciously, they're not conscious creators of their choices. So, and I remember there was many choices that made no sense at all, um, but it was following the feeling inside. So I define values as your emotional compass. So I've learned how to follow that emotional compass and... Um, there's a lot of wisdom in that emotional compass that exists in all of us. Yeah. So what I'm most proud of is those moments, those pivotal moments, just a handful of moments, where I've made the courageous decision to go into the unknown rather than try to reverse back into a place that I don't fit into anymore. 
And thank goodness you did because, <laughs> you, you know, over 6,000 coaches that you've coached and if you think about all the people that they've coached and the ripple effect that that has had. Yeah, and I appreciate you saying that. I also believe that it, even if I hadn't made those decisions, those 6,000 coaches would have been trained by someone somewhere somehow. So... Um, so I don't, I don't, um, you know, kind of like um, look at it like that. But uh, th- but the fact that I was involved in their lives because yeah. of those decisions gives me incredible fulfilment. Like it's a it's a wonderful, joyous feeling of of peace. It's a peaceful joy. It's it's beautiful. I, I remember you said something. I can't remember what you said, but it relates to to this is when you give something without any expectation of return. So when you're training these people and you're sending them out to the world to do their amazing work, to be able to do that and really not, it's not like even a legacy as such. It's like, okay, I can give this and if no one remembers who I am, then that's okay because that's not why I'm giving it. Yes. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. I think... um yeah, it's, it sounds ludicrous to say this, but it's like you, you kind of, as a teacher, you need to disappear, you know? Yeah. Um, so, which is, yeah, it doesn't kind of make sense, but I know, I know, I, I know what I mean when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you're, you're, you know, it's probably the, 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 the kid in the Catholic school coming out of me, but it's like, you know, I just, I just choose to believe that I'm an instrument of peace i'm an instrument of joy i'm an instrument of of those two things so and it's not me doing that it's it's i'm I'm simply the conduit i've chosen to be the conduit of that and um that's kind of how i see it so um yeah and that and that uh, that gives me great uh, peace within the peace because it's like whenever I've, I've faced um uncertainties like i remember in 2014 that was a big year for my business in financially and also spiritually and emotionally because it was the first year, the first time ever in my career that I was in a commercial space and I decided to go all out talking about love, vulnerability, care, all the emotional flexibility stuff that I teach. And, um, and this was in a, in, a, in, a, in a strong commercial environment. That was salespeople, right? And I had them for two days. And I thought to myself, I'm going to go all out Unfiltered, and if they don't like it, fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't belong there. I'll yeah. belong somewhere else. Yeah. And um, man, the, like they absolute to say they loved it is a, is, a, is an understatement. And then people were telling me things like people coming to me in tears. Yeah. You know, with with, um, with the life changing moments that they had in that training. I had, Sylvana was in that training too, so I spoke about my marriage um, with her in the room. Unfiltered in, yeah. in, in, in all its beauty and all of its uh, difficulties at times and all that sort of stuff. And people just loved that because it was like someone was talking at the front of the room, you know, the words that they either wouldn't utter themselves or didn't want to utter or didn't want to say, or I put language into a cloud of whatever problem they were, they were experiencing. So um, that was a big year because that changed, and they, and they paid me like a lot of money to do that training, like a lot of money. And they changed everything. Suddenly, my fees went up because I could do it. Yeah. Um, suddenly, it's like I'm free because now I can actually not be contained. I can actually speak the way I want to speak to any room, and I know that I can present the message in a way now that can be accepted by most. And uh, and that's what accelerated my development. Just doing that. That was a defining moment. And I remember um, the night before that training, consciously making that decision. And then the morning of that training, um, there's a church next door. I'm not religious at all. Um, I believe in God and all that kind of stuff, but I'm not, you know, I'm not religious. But I, there's a church next door to us that uh, where my sons go to school, and the church building is always open except for this, this COVID stuff. Um, and so I went into that church and I sat there and I, and when I say I prayed, I didn't pray in a literal sense, but I sat there and I said to myself, "Remember what you have chosen to believe." that you are because I'm not saying I am this because I don't know I've chosen to believe to be an instrument of that peace and an instrument of that joy so if you are if that's if that's true then you can allow yourself to be that instrument and you're not going to be torn down it's yeah. a, you're going to be okay so I just made, I remember that was a I was scared I was excited I was everything under the sun plus the guy who employed me to do that workshop was an ex-mentor of mine when I was working in real estate so I, I used to put him up on uh, on a pedestal um, he's a brilliant public speaker. 
Um, and uh, I used to hold him up beyond what I should have. Um, and so he became my client. So the expectations were incredibly high. And I thought, well, this is, a, this is not even a calculated risk. This is just simply a gross risk of just letting it all hang out and see what happens. And I've found so far in the last 14 years, JJ, those moments when you are unfiltered and you speak your truth, the world embraces you. Yeah. It's when you try to manipulate your message or you try to smother your communication that the world sees you as that. <laughs> so yeah. they respond differently, right? Yeah. So. I often talk to my clients in regards of like dropping your mask yeah. of and then being who you truly are. And I know we talk about authenticity, it's thrown around a lot, but yeah. from my point of view my journey as well it's so freeing to be able to just be who you are and yeah, and completely. you know warts and all vulnerability and be able to speak from the heart um and then you're serving so many more people in a really truly authentic way as well well then you, you attract the right people because yeah. you're attracting people who resonate with that message and yeah. uh, life is so much easier when you're with people who resonate with your your purpose, so, so yeah. yeah, and I and one thing that came to mind too when you were talking about your fees, I remember the day, and we were at the old, the coaching institute office oh, yeah. where yeah. wherever yeah. that was, and I remember being in your course, and we had to stand up, and we had to say what our hourly rate was. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and um, I remember being so like I remember that hook in my stomach and I think we started off with $30 an hour or something, maybe even less than that. And I had a hook right at the start and you're like, (laughs) now you might be getting a hook soon or whatever your language was. And I had the freaking hook at the lowest (laughs) amount. Um, So that that just brought back that memory because I know that, you know, as I've grown, I've became more real. You know, this is who I am. I take my shoes off for my training, Joe. Like... (laughs) Good some idea. some people will turn their nose up. I'm like, here I am, what's yeah. and all. Um, but also from from a value point of view to yeah. say, like, this is the value I give. And yeah. so this is, you know, what I, I get in return. And that's I deserve right. that yeah. for what I give. Absolutely. You yeah. know, that's the value I give. Yeah. So as a leader, what values do you live by? Um, health and vitality, gratitude and appreciation is a big part. Um, joy and peace. I've mentioned that probably 37 times in this conversation. <laughs> um, uh, there's, um, um, how do I say this? The, the theme is, the other value theme is more around the lifelong learning, um, curiosity kind of uh, journey. Um, that's an important value. Um, and uh, and that, that sort of blends in with wisdom. So So wisdom to me is, being curious about the next phase or stage of what you are becoming and who you're becoming and and moving closer to the essence of what that is, you know. Um, connecting more with the essence of you, the spirit of you, the, the God in you, whatever you want to call it in you. Um, that, that, that to me has been the journey all the way through. So, so my values are kind of like around that. So health and vitality is really important because of all the obvious reasons, of course, about health, but, but also to me that's a part of... Um, I say to my wife all, you know, I say all the time, you know, a number of times, which makes no sense to her and makes this makes no sense to anyone else in the world, but it makes sense to me. And that is the health of vitality to me is like, um, you know, I run a lot. I do lots of running. And to me, the purpose of my life is to run, which sounds ludicrous to people from the outside because I do all these other things. But it's like, but I know what that means. It's like my spirit can't experience that anywhere else. So... It's come here to enjoy the joy of the fluidity of the physical movement and how great that feels. So my values are heavily surrounded around that. And then there's a big uh, amplification around gratitude and appreciation. Like, rarely does a day or a week go by where I'm not grateful and appreciative of something, yeah. um, you know, in, in, in my life. So that's a big part of it. So gratitude, appreciation, health and vitality to me are the, are the, um, the captains, the main sort of drivers of, um, of my values. Yeah. So, and self-regulation is another part. I mentioned that before we started the, the press play here. Um, self-regulation sounds really boring, um, but to me it's, uh, it's balance. So, um, you know, we were talking about wine before, you know, and, and how you don't drink any alcohol anymore for your own yeah. personal reasons. Whereas um, for me, my relationship with wine is I, I love having that glass of wine every, every night, most nights. 
but I also know that one of my values is self-regulation. So, yeah. um, which means there's no, there's no thought of going into four glasses or a bottle. It doesn't it doesn't even come close to that. It's one glass and that's it. And then you know when it comes to my other favourites, you know pizzas and chocolate and stuff like that. Yeah. You know the self-regulation. There's self-regulation in what I say to people. You know, yeah. understanding when to shut up and when to speak up. You know. Yeah. And the difference between those two things. Um, so self-regulation is part of that values um, sort of themes as well. If Beautiful. That makes any sense. And as a coach, you, you're, you've talked about health and and of course mindset, keeping your mindset really strong. What are the habits that you have? personally that you do every single day to set you up for the day the week well running is a big part of that so i run probably five at least five times a week generally sometimes six Um, that's my main ritual and i love it because there's all these different kinds of running that you can do from hard training to relax runs etc um so to me that's a big part of it physical movement is 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 important and in the mornings um you know, I spend between 30 minutes and 60 minutes, roughly, uh, every morning, five, six days a week when I say every morning, um, reading something that inspires me or that um, keeps me in, on track with what I'm about, if that makes yeah. any sense. So yeah. um, that's really, really important. Um, and also, I'm, a, I'm an investor, so I've got, I've got money invested in all these different vehicles, you know, all these different investment um uh, um, I'll call them investment channels, I guess, you know, from real estate through to shares through to everything else. And uh, I love, as part of my ritual in the morning, um, I just love looking at those numbers every morning, regardless of whether they're going up or down. But it's just part of my um, my, my joy, you know. It's yeah. like, it's good. It's like watching, it's like a gardener having the, the joy out of seeing that sprout coming out of the dirt or the first flower coming out of that tree or whatever it might be. Um, and that's one way I look at my investments. So that might sound a bit strange, but that's it's part of my... <laughs> I love it. I love numbers. Yeah. I love looking at those. So, how many marathons have you run so far? I've done seven full and twenty-one half marathons. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I just, uh, I don't run. I, I, there was a time where I did run. I do walk every day, so I love that. Uh, but I remember one of my um, girlfriends who I just did a podcast with. Actually, she taught me to run from one from one tree to another and I swear the trees are really far <laughs> out I, I, she stitched me up but I remember doing one run and it was at Williamstown I can't remember if it was like um four kilometers twice yeah but the thing is that you had to and I'd never run that far ever and what I remember thinking in my head is oh my goodness not only am I doing this, say it was eight kilometres, not only am I doing eight kilometres, but I've got to run past where I started. Yeah. <laughs> so from a mindset point of view, yeah. I was like, how am I going to channel? Because I'm thinking, once I come back to the start, I'm going to think, shit, I've got to do all that again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I for me, I had this strategy of, okay, when I get around, I'm going to get really freaking excited. And so I was do- doing a party in my head <laughs> but as a strategy strategy so i can imagine as a marathon runner yeah. how you would have to have you know set up your mindset to be able to to do that yeah well at the beginning of every race whether it's a 5k race a 42 kilometer thing or a 21k thing or, or any other form of running it's the expectation is what uh, influences your mindset so you know if you know you're going to be running 42 kilometers which is just yeah it's a bit crazy um you know there's a completely different uh mindset that goes with. so for example the first couple of uh, marathons that i did i was actually literally i was scared i was scared because I, I was i was putting i was going to put my body through something that i knew was extreme and i had no clue what that even meant yeah so you know and, and it didn't help that in my first marathon um a friend of mine bought up bought a bought a friend of his to the marathon and um you know, he, he said to me, oh, this is my second one. And I was asking all these questions like, how does it feel? And is it true that after 30K, that's when it begins and all this? And um, he said to me, and he pointed to some footpath that was uh, on the side of the road on our way to the start line. And he said, oh, I remember last year I got to that, I finished the race. He says, and I was walking back to my uh, car. Um, and he said, I got to that point there and I sat and I couldn't move. And I was there for hours because I, I couldn't move. And it didn't matter whether a truck was going to hit me or not. I just couldn't move. And, I, and, I, and when I heard that, I just got so scared. I thought, yeah. 
is is that what's going to happen to me like you know so the first couple of marathons were really really scary i had to do them with other people Mm. and i had to do them very very um in a very conservative way like run a lot slower than what i knew i could run it and then um yeah it wasn't until the fourth and fifth marathon that i had the courage to go and do one by myself (laughs) with a strategy to race it and and do great time so well great time to me anyway but um yeah, so the, the, the mindset is often influenced by the expectation that you have on what you're about to do. So quite a different mindset to, say, jogging five kilometers around the block, right? Where your expectation is, I'm just going to chill. Yeah. So your expectation influences your mindset big time. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. So my, my expectation of that two-day workshop of, you know, what I wanted to, what I was expecting of myself and what I would love to share set up my mindset for that so i hope i'm making sense. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. in your career and in your life who's been your biggest teacher um i wouldn't say biggest teacher i'd say there's been lots of different teachers yeah. um so in my life so i'll go chronological um my both my parents are still alive and married and together for good reason uh, my dad would probably be the first person because he 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 has always run his own business he was a car mechanic at a caltech service station and all these different he was in that sort of realm of physical work and also he built houses and houses and stuff so he was always a leader to me so he taught me work ethic but i redefined work ethic his work ethic was volume like 80 to 100 hours a week yeah my work ethic translated to efficiency so to me it's like you know earn the most and work the least hours kind of thing and which is what another gift of coaching is giving me. But um, so he was my first hero, um, and then moving forward from there, when I started working in the real estate space, um, we had a mentor there, um, whose uh, name was uh, Neil Genman, who's a who, who back then in the '90s was a very um, he he you either all in or all out with him. He was very divisive in the real estate world. He introduced me to personal development, so he's 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 one of my um, heroes, one of my and and by a hero as a, as a trainer as a coach he was he was pretty good, and then um, I had the the beautiful good fortune of meeting a couple called Michael and Marlies Carroll who introduced me into the world of meditation the silent retreats the vision quests all those experiential breath work and all the different stuff that we did they absolutely changed the trajectory of my life for sure so they're heroes of mine um, throughout this whole throughout all of this my wife's been a hero of mine from the very beginning. Um, and and then of course when I started my coaching business I met Sharon Pearson who's the creator of the Coaching Institute so she's been a big a big um, uh, inspiration and um, and hero of mine as well as, as um, also now you know, we're fr- we're friends you know 14 years later we're we're still uh, you know in in solid relationship and um, and then um, moving forward from there that's pretty much that's the timeline um, and then I've got my best friend who's also been a very big influence in my life so. These are the people that have influenced me in different ways. Some people have influ- influenced me spiritually. Some have influenced me commercially and uh, from a financial perspective. Other people have influenced me from a relationship perspective. Um, so, yeah, they're kind of like my heroes. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the other thing, I mentioned my son before. I can imagine having two twin boys, like Oliver and Nicholas. Yeah. What have they taught you? And I know that you've mentioned before that they're two different personalities. You know, they've got their own um, ways about things. Yeah, yeah. Because kids can be such the best teachers, I think. Yeah, look, absolutely. I mean, um, with them, sometimes it's like I want to be a kid with them. And yeah. if I'm a kid for too long with them, they, they like I remember, <laughs> I remember being at home with them alone. Someone was out somewhere, and we were playing, doing some silly stuff, and and we were carry, I was carrying on, they were carrying on, and I was carrying on more and more. And then Nicholas said, "Okay, Dad, you can stop that now. You can be Dad again." It's like, so what do you mean? This is me. This is me. <laughs> we're, we're doing this. And he said, "No, I don't feel safe. You need to be grown up." <laughs> and, I thought, wow, and I was really proud of that because, and that's more my wife's, uh, you know, my wife's contribution rather than me, I think, in that he had the maturity to say, okay, you can stop that now because you're not making me feel safe. You're meant to be my dad. Yeah. So many moments like that 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 have come up in our in our conversations with our kids, with our boys, that uh, 
have kind of like perked me up and gone, shit, okay, I better um, mind my language and mind my body yeah. language and mind my, <laughs> you know, the way I speak. It's, uh, it's been quite amazing. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, and I love Tony Robbins, um, has said, he says that sometimes we can, I think this is what he says, I'll, I'll, I'll make it up a little bit, um, that we overestimate what we can achieve in a week, I think mm. that's right, yeah. and underestimate what we can achieve in 10 years, like yeah. in a decade. Yeah. You looking back at what you've achieved, like how have you grown as a coach in that time? Um, I don't know. Gee, um, it's hard to say because uh, you don't realise how far you've come until you yeah. compare yourself to 10 or 14 years ago, and I don't even remember. Um I think I've I've become a lot more, even more grounded, more calmer. Um, how have I grown? Ask me the question again. <laughs> how have you grown in? So ten years, ten years ago, what is your journey? If you look back at that, Joe Parne, trainer, coach, speaker, coacher, yeah. coaching, <laughs> coach. You know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how you know how how have you changed? Well, I think my children have changed me more than anything because yeah. being, becoming a dad. Um, has crystallized absolutely what is most important or what are the important things in my life. So I think that's brought a deeper sense of certainty within me uh, as a trainer and as a coach. Yeah. Um, it's given me a clearer um, sense of my identity. So because I'm clearer and stronger on that and also being clear on what I'm not, um, I think that's brought a deeper certainty and, and, and as Sharon said to me a long time ago she said you know um, as long as your certainty exceeds the doubt of the client or the doubt of the audience you will always be the leader of the room yeah and I think in the early days 10 14 years ago or 14 years ago when I started that certainty was all um, me modeling and pretending it and just trying to you know get on with it whereas now uh, I think the gaps between how people would see me on the outside and how I truly saw myself on the inside there is no gap there anymore so, because normally what you see on the outside of someone is not a reflection of their inner world. Their inner world is not the same. Whereas my inner world, I like to wear on my sleeve and it's okay now because there's, there is that deep certainty of understanding and knowing, for me anyway, what matters, what doesn't matter, who I am, who I'm not. And, and I think that's what's given me the courage to be a stronger communicator, a stronger trainer um, in any commercial environment. Um, I, like one of my new clients, I want to say new from about a year and a half ago, um, is um, and I'm still doing a bit of work with them is uh, NBN. And uh, before the COVID thing hit, one of my last trains that I did was um, at this uh, fancy place in Sydney. Uh, 45 engineers from NBN, ma- mainly like 95 percent of them were men. Very much you know logical C energy, you know very yeah. technical based and all this sort of thing. And, uh, and I just did my own thing. Like I, I had the whole day with them on teaching them my emotional fitness stuff. And um, I, I just did my usual thing. It was like me talking to you, JJ. You know? yeah. but, and I wasn't thinking they're engineers, so I've got to be more conservative or whatever. I just did my thing. And, um, and I remember the HR manager, like even months later, saying to me, I still can't believe the feedback that those guys were giving, you know, giving us about that training. It was like... You know, I was expecting that um, they were going to come back to us and tell us never to do that again, or something like that, right? Yeah. And and I, and I and I remember inside me going, I'm not at all surprised by that. You yeah. know, Like, how can it be anything else? So it's that genuine sense of deep certainty that I think has grown that ten years ago wasn't there. Yeah. Is that making sense? Yeah. Yeah. And um, and that deep certainty carries with me everywhere, and I think that makes a massive difference in how people perceive and respond and react. And that's why I feel genuine sense of confidence whenever I go into any room to do my thing. Because, you know, it might sound like an egotistical comment and if it does, so be it. But um, I do know with certainty that when I go and teach my emotional fitness work, that I know more about emotions than anyone in that room. And that gives me that sense of um, confidence and certainty, if that makes sense. And then from that comes authority, and then from that comes, uh, you know, the, the message actually sinking into people's hearts and minds. So. Yeah. I'm really interested in your emotional fitness formula that you've created, yeah. the online course. Yeah. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. Well, fundamentally, so the emotional fitness formula is an accumulation of all the work for the last 14 years. Yeah. 
And someone said to me, that's great, but you need to you know, create some core principles out of it. Like, how do you, how do you explain it? So there are, there are five core principles to, to emotional fitness, according to the world of Joe, right? <laughs> so, um, the, and these five core principles are in order, like, a, um, like the, the um, Matryoshka dolls, the Babushka dolls. You know, you've got the yeah, big yeah. doll all the way <laughs> to the small doll? Yeah. Well, the big doll, the first core principle is, is the, the core principles of identity and understanding the different phases, identity phases that we all go through in life. So we all go through these um, identity phases of where initially we define ourselves by our bodies, then we define ourselves by the results that we're getting in life, then ultimately we transform into our, um, defining ourselves by the legacy that we're leaving behind, and then ultimately we define ourselves by the spirit, the essence of who we are really. Um, and that's a whole journey and a whole thing that goes with that. So identity is a big part because like, that's the biggest core principle of my work because um, I have found that pretty much all mental and, and, um, and this is a strong statement and, and some people will be put, put off by this maybe but um, all mental health and emotional health issues are identity crisis issues because if you truly know who you are and you're clear on that that means you're clear on your values if you're clear on your values you can you've got the the capacity to live with freedom. And my definition of freedom is when you're living absolutely aligned to your values. That's freedom. So identity is a massive. So I, I spend a lot of time in my workshops, you know, fleshing that out with people. Uh, the second core principle then is life stages. So we, we go through these different life stages that are in alignment to these identity phases. So in life stages, I talk about the ambition-driven world and the meaning-driven world. And, uh, and the evolution that, that every human being, the journey that every human being is on to evolve away from the ambition-driven world into the meaning-driven world and then finding ways to integrate the ambition into meaning. So to speak in plain language, the ambition-driven world is all about uh, achievement and getting and um, winning and slowest and fastest and best and, and shiniest and all that. And you're competing with everyone else and it's a very egocentric world. In that world is where all the anxiety and depression exists. When we evolve organically into the meaning-driven world, our life then becomes about others. And as I've said in many in many workshops, you know, um, the human condition is wired to serve. It's yeah. wired to serve. So, the purpose of life is to be of service to humanity, service to your market, service to your community, or whatever it might be. So, the meaning-driven world is where people start to align themselves to what really matters in, in how they want to express themselves. But then you have to integrate the ambition-driven world into that. So you know, that's life stages. The third core principle um, is the principle of perspective. You can't have an emotionally healthy life with a, with a dirty perspective because perspective's got to be clean and there's I've got frameworks and models around that. Um, and then you've got values is the fourth core principle, the emotional compass, and the fifth core principle is emotional flexibility. So identity, life stages, you know, um, perspective, values, and emotional flexibility are the five core areas um, that uh, you know that I've been teaching over the last uh, you know few years now, and and that's been exciting because um, finally all the ideas I have around all the emotional stuff I have categorized and 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 this can be translated into a workshop for people to actually understand. So, yeah. Um, yes, that's 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 the fundamental essence of it. Love that, yeah. and I'm loving your podcasts. Oh, I've, thank you. I have listened to 36 of them. Oh my god! And I'm waiting for your next one. <laughs> Every time you say there's a, a new one out, I'm like, right, I'm onto it, and I listen to it when I do my I recorded, walk. I recorded the 37th one last night. <laughs> so, oh, so what can we expect from that one? Can we have a teaser? Um, well, that one there. What did I talk about? I spoke about. Um, I spoke about how. A lot of people are slaves to their history. And I said there are four fundamental reasons why people get trapped in their history and their story. Um, there's habits that they're still trapped into from the past. There's expectations. They're, they're trying to create expectations of their future, but based on conditioned expectations of the past. There's fear. Uh, and then there's reasoning, you know, logical yeah. reasoning that says, oh, you can't do that or you can't become that. So. I just talk about how those four elements um, hold people back in a trap of their past and how they were slaves to their past. And um, 
yeah, I just share some insights into that. So Beautiful. So, guys, if you're listening, mate, of course you're listening. Of course you've stayed on all this time. Uh, get on to Insights with Joe Parne because those podcasts are amazing. I absolutely love them. Thanks, uh, And so what's next for Joe Parne? Well, the Emotional Fitness Formula is going to be uh, ready as an online program very soon. And uh, from that, there's a, there's a, there'll be a book that will come with that. So I'm looking A forward. book? Yeah, finally, a book. Yay! Yeah. Look what I've got in front of me. You've got my old decoding comments. I love this. I just thought I'd show you with all my so good. highlighted sections. I absolutely love that's this now, book. That's now 10 years old, that book. There you go. Yeah, it's 10 years old. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, the emotional fitness principles that I just shared with you um, will be in a book. That's my next thing. The the, the formula is the next, the online program is the, is the next thing with the book. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and I'm excited to be, you know, opening up to international markets. So I just picked up my first American client, uh, official American pain client, um, about a month ago because of the emotional fitness work. And because of the COVID, I didn't have to fly to uh, Wisconsin. I, I just delivered the training from my study at home through Zoom. So, and, um, so I think when you say what's next, I think, I think, you know, the possibility of international markets is probably time. So we'll see what happens. I mean... You know, all I'll, all I'll keep doing is doing what I'm doing and see where it takes me. Yeah. <laughs> and if the guys want to look and, and see what you're doing and follow you, of course, you're on Instagram, Joe Parne. Yeah. You've also got a new website that you've developed. It's yeah. in development. Yeah. So it's just uh, joeparne.com.au. Uh, on there is the link to the podcast. Um, there's uh, another big part of my work is um, behavioral profiling that you know all about. You've been involved yeah. with me in the past. So the behavioural profiling, where if you're a, you know if you're a coach or a consultant, uh, it's an instrument for people to you know un- unveil the unconscious emotional themes going on in people's lives and how that's been holding them back. And I'm doing a free training on that in August, and the info- and the details of that are on that website as well. Yeah. Um, and people can follow me on uh, on Facebook. I think the handle is uh, at Joe Pioneer Insights. Uh, and the podcast link is on that website too. So pretty much through that website, they can get you know, all, all the stuff that I have. So guys, I'll put the link below uh, on this podcast so that you can easily access cool. Joe's amazing stuff. Now, are you ready for JJ's rapid fire questions? Well, I, I don't know because I, I, didn't, I didn't know about this. So you mentioned it briefly before we started talking. I thought, okay. Well, right, this is what we're doing. Go. All righty. So what's the best piece of advice given to you? Given to me. Um, do the right thing. Do the right thing. Favourite book? Favourite book. Any of David Hawkins' books. I looked him up. <laughs> the Eye of the Eye. The Eye of the Eye. There you go. The Eye of the Eye. Yeah. Who would play you in a movie? Oh, God. Oh, I don't know. I could say Brad Pitt, but that's a total bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Vin Diesel. Okay. I'll go with that. <laughs> What's one thing on your bucket list? Um... Um, working in working from around the world. Beautiful. If you could trade lives with anyone for one day, who would it be and why? Well, first of all, I wouldn't. But uh, if I had to do that, who would I? Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama. Because I'd be curious to know if I had to experience him, I'd want to know what it's like to be in his consciousness and how he experiences life. Okay. Yeah, beautiful. Three words that describe you. Love, peace, and joy. (laughs) Peace and joy. Here we go again. If you could have any five people currently dead or alive to have dinner with, who would you choose? My wife. Yes. My best mate. Um, Oh, dear. What's his name? The guy that was in jail for 27 years. Oh, yeah. I've gone blank. That's how much I know him. Oh, my God. Mandela. I'll be curious to have Mandela there. I want David Hawkins there. Yeah. David Hawkins there. Um, and a fifth person. I don't know. I would have... I'll say, I'll say my dad. Beautiful. Yeah. If you could have one superpower, what, what would you have... No logic to this. Invisibility just comes as the first thing that comes to my mind. <laughs> what sitcom, TV sitcom family would you be a member of? <laughs> um, 
I'd probably be the George in Seinfeld. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what legacy do you want to be remembered for? That's your last question. What legacy do you want to be remembered for? Um, that he taught us how to fall back in love with ourselves. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Joe, Thanks, for your time. It's You're been welcome. such a pleasure. And as uh, I said on the podcast, you, the, the guys will be hearing me talk so much about you. Mm-hmm. And um, I really appreciate everything that you've done for me and um, my mm-hmm. growth and my personal growth and um, the ripple effect that you've had on my life. So thank you so much. No, thank you, JJ. Th- and I really appreciate you having me on here. And um, it's phenomenal seeing you uh, again because, um, you know, as you know, we met, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, in one of the coaching training rooms. And you see, when I see people like you doing the magic that you're doing and all the stuff that you're doing, it, it gives purpose to the to the trainings that I do, you yeah. see? Because if people go to the trainings and do nothing, then what's the point? You know, the money can only last for so long in terms of it's, you know, it's the stuff you get out of that. It's um, seeing the beautiful people like you who have who have taken the journey and have embraced it, and I think that's magic. So thanks for having me, and it's wonderful seeing you. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Joe. Thanks for tuning in to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and follow me on Instagram at JJ Speaker Coach. And remember to live with insatiable passion, create an empowered life and inspire others to live theirs.